with ourselves. Knowledge is power. really honored to uh to get the invites here i was listening to your show love it awesome i i appreciate your uh authenticity your curiosity and and uh, there's a great vibe coming from through your voice when you're speaking i feel uh you know comforted i feel like we've known each other for a while so i'm excited to see where this conversation goes <laughs> man thank you so much yeah I'm, I'm really happy to have you too brent i've um i've been consuming your content for some time so it's cool too. I've actually thought about messaging you for quite some time to get you on here, um, but it's, it, the scheduling for my podcast is a little wonky. I'm, my schedule is a bit inconsistent, so um, uh, the last thing I would want to do is have to like reschedule because I get a gig that really needs me or something. So, um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm I'm pretty pumped to talk to you too. I I was just listening to your stuff this morning again. And uh, I, I kind of had that same thing. Like it kind of, um, I know it's a little dorky, but it feels like we've known each other or something. Like there's yeah. just some relate, uh, uh, relatability to the things that you talk about. And I think there's something to be said about, um, you know, there's, there's an innate loneliness that comes with the Kundalini Awakening experience. Because you're like, who do I talk to about this? Who knows anything about this? So just hearing someone who's gone through the same thing, you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a, a major overarching theme of, of being alone and uh, confused and, and wondering what the hell's going on with you for sure, for sure. Yeah, and then, um, <laughs> I, yeah, and then trying to explain to someone, you know, because people want to listen to us, people, you know, who love us are, you know, they're open eared in every way. They're like, I, I want to help you. What are you going through? Seems like you're going through something. But then you try to explain, you know, a, a way that you put it before was a, a snake coming out of your butt. Uh, and that, that made me laugh, like <laughs> trying to explain to someone, yeah, well, there's a serpent <laughs> going up my spine and I'm distressed about it. And, you know, so it's, yeah. uh, it's pretty tough. <laughs> well, um, cool, man. Uh, so like I said, it's, it's pretty casual on my end. Um, I like to be able to have space for both of us to kind of ramble on, um, and, uh, you know, stumble upon the questions that, that are natural. Um, but I would love to start with kind of your bio, your background, who are you? Um, how did you get into Kundalini Awakening? And then we can kind of go, what is Kundalini Awakening after that? And we'll, we'll let it rip after that. So I would love sure. to know, Brent, who are you? What is it that you do? Well, I go by Brent Spirit. Of course, that's uh, an alias. My first name is Brent. Uh, Spirit came about uh, just with a, it was just a branding issue. I work as a photographer under my, uh, you know, my given name. And when I began doing this spiritual work, maybe you've experienced it yourself, Jacob. I know you're involved in a few things. Branding is a whole... Uh, it's a whole challenge, you know, how do you present yourself? So I was doing photography and of course I'm interested in, uh, you know, Kundalini awakening, spiritual awakening, some kind of weird stuff. And initially I started, uh, you know, just as my, my given name with these two different, very, very conflicting, uh, uh, explorations and people were getting a little freaked out and stuff. So I had to separate my brands. And so I came up with Brent spirit just to denote the, uh, you know, the spiritual aspect. So I go by Brent spirit. Um, and I like to say that I'm a spiritual teacher over the past, uh, 15 years or so I've undergone a pretty intense spiritual awakening journey, uh, involving things like Kundalini awakening, uh, Kundalini process, uh, there's some been some interesting shifts in perception, um, some ups and downs overall that we'll get into. But in short, uh, after some of the the shifts that I, I went through, I began writing online uh, back in the in the days of Tumblr. I was uh, just writing online about some of my experiences as a way to process things. Um, and people began to say, "Hey, you know, similar things have happened to me." I'm really stuck here. I'm challenged with this. Do you have something for me? Do you have some insight, some advice, some guidance? 
maybe even a resource. And so I ended up, you know, responding to some of these questions. And then the questions became coming, you know, more and more frequently. And suddenly I found myself playing the role of spiritual teacher. So that's how I found myself in this role. But um, we can uh, backtrack a little bit and explore a little bit of how this all began for me. So I've told my story in a few different places already. So I'll try and come at it from a different angle. Maybe uh, there's some things that uh, we can discuss a little more. I, I know in uh, some of your episodes, you were talking about things like um, dissociation, mm -hmm. um, you know, this this kind of being out of your body, you know, being disembodied, this type of thing. And so in reflecting on, uh, you know, how our conversation might go, I thought maybe maybe I could start talking a little bit about my experiences of dissociation. So as a young kid, I felt very free in the sense that I didn't feel that I was this body or I was the mind. I don't even think I had a formulated an ego per se. Um, this identity of like Brent, the little boy, I don't think there was Brent, the little boy, there was just life. And I was experiencing life. And there wasn't a clear distinction between I'm here and the world is out there. There wasn't like a separation. It was just life happening. Of course, I couldn't articulate any of this back then. Looking back now, I can put some words to it. But still, I don't think, think it really captures it. But it was basically a sort of meditative state, free from the attachment identification with the body. And from that freedom also came... Uh, the space to, I guess, what we would call dissociate. So as I became to get older, I would go through different experiences that would now begin to form this identity of Brent. I began to feel that I was my body and the world was out there and maybe there were threats in the world. And so I had to protect this body. I had to protect this ego, this mind uh, who could be threatened, um, challenged, offended, or traumatized, um, you know, labeled all these sorts of things so then this ego began to form identification with the body began to form but i found myself at times when i was going through something traumatic maybe even if i was if i was just getting you know lectured by my parents uh because i had done something wrong i found myself dissociating and leaving my body and it felt like a protective mechanism a survival mechanism to uh avoid the intense situation. So I found myself leaving my body. But from there, it was, it wasn't like when I was a younger kid, it was now a little bit uncomfortable and scary. Mm. And I remember, you know, maybe somebody was threatening me, um, or, or scolding me. Or, you know, one time I remember I had done something wrong, the teacher took me outside the classroom, and was talking to me in the hallway. And I remember leaving my body, and she became like, very tiny in my perception, like a little tiny little person, just her head was just, you know, scolding me. And I was just, just listening to this talking happening, but you know, completely out of my body in a place where I felt safe. Um, and so there's, a, there was like this blending of this meditative state, this dissociative state, um, using it. Initially, it was freedom. Now it was more of like, escaping to survive. So there's like these, uh, these themes that are emerging. Um, eventually, in high school, I found myself um, really depressed, I'd gone through some heartbreak, you know, the ups and downs of high school. And I, I, I don't think that um, it's unusual. I think we all go through some sort of uh, chaos in high school. But for whatever reason, I was really sensitive and fell into a really deep depression. At the time, I didn't know it was depression. I didn't know what depression was. I didn't know what anxiety was. I just felt I'm sad. And of course, I'm sad. Life sucks. Um, and so, you know, it didn't seem like a mental health issue. I don't think mental health was even a conversation back then. Mm -hmm. About 15 years ago, it wasn't. I, I imagine you two had, you know, very little mental health awareness mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, go on, ahead. Yeah, on. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it was just, I just felt alone, sad, I didn't know, you know, who do I talk to, you know, it was, it was just like this experience I was having. But I found that instead of being able to now dissociate, I was like, stuck in my body, like suffocating in this body in the mind, I couldn't 
find any reprieve, any release, any spaciousness. It was me. It was I was completely identified with these feelings, completely identified with the mind. I was a victim to the world that you know had victimized me, that was out there separate from me. And that meditative state I had as a child, even the ability to kind of dissociate was completely unavailable to me. Um, and so I felt like I was quite literally suffocating in my body. Um, eventually, I found ideas of meditation and mindfulness that laid a bit of a roadmap and pointed me towards getting a bit of spaciousness again. So if you're familiar with Eckhart Tolle, he's got the book, uh, The Power of Now. He explains about how we become identified with the thoughts. We think that we are the thought stream. The pain in the body, we become identified with it. And, you know, they fuel each other. The more emotional negativity you feel in your body, it fuels more negative thoughts, which fuels more negative emotions, and there's momentum. But what he said was, you could take a step back and you can witness this unfolding. You could witness the thoughts. You could witness the, the emotions in your body. And from witnessing, you're able to take a step back and then you can allow that momentum to uh, to play itself out and, uh, you know, wind down. And so I found this and I, you know, it felt so familiar to me to be able to witness and take a step back and just observe it felt so familiar. And then in these the Eckhart Tolle's work, he says, you know, this is stuff that you've always known. Mm. This is nothing new here that I'm showing you. It's what we've always known. You're just remembering. And that's really what it felt like. And quite literally, I could think, you know, this is what I felt like as a child. And so it validated what I was experiencing. And so I said, okay, you know, I have to just continue this practice of being a witness, of observing and taking space. And so I began to find ideas from the East, yoga, meditation, Buddhism, mindfulness. And I thought initially, interesting, I thought it was Eckhart Tolle who came up with all of this stuff himself. Mm. I thought, man, this guy's a genius. And so when I found ideas from Buddhism and Hinduism and yoga, I thought, oh, wait, this guy. He didn't come up with this by himself. He's put it into words that I can understand. You know, he stripped it out of the, the religious and cultural context so that I can digest it. And then still, that's a feat and an incredible accomplishment. Still so grateful for him. And so uh, at some point, I thought, you know, I'll try this thing called meditation. So before this, I was, if I can clarify here, I was practicing witnessing just throughout my day like I would just sit and become like a field of awareness and look around and maybe it was during work or play but I didn't sit to meditate so I thought you know let me try this thing you know to sit in meditation and and turn inwards and see what that's all about and still my intention was to overcome depression and anxiety um it wasn't about enlightenment or self-realization or anything like that it was just finding peace so I remember uh being in my basement actually um and I sat down in meditation and suddenly, like instantly, my my neck began to uh, arch and my my chin became to my chest. And then I started to go backwards. And, and uh, you know, this is really strange. It's happening spontaneously. I, I can't stop it. I don't know why this is doing this. And I felt almost like, like something was coming alive in me that was controlling my body in this way. I opened my eyes. I said, I don't know what that was about. Um, I'm just going to not do that anymore. <laughs> I left it at that. I said, I'm happy with the mindfulness approaches, just, you know, being out and about during my day, remembering to come into the present moment, to be a witness. I like those practices. They're working for me. I don't know what the heck that's, that scary experience was about. I let it be. Didn't make much of it after that. Didn't talk to anybody about it. Um, left it at that. Now, I mean, I could pause there. Um, have you experienced something similar in terms of meditation, you know, these spontaneous movements and that sort of thing? Oh man. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, there's so many things that I resonate with, um, in so many different directions that I can take it. Uh, I mean, firstly, thank you for being vulnerable and like opening up about, um, you know, how you came through this, uh, through anxiety and depression and not so much like, you know, you read the word Kundalini in a book and you're like, I want to try that. You know, uh, I, I think that's kind of a, a, a big point for a lot of us as we stumble into it or it's, um, you know, Kundalini almost happens to you or you think, uh, what is to you? 
And then you're, you're catapulted on this whole spiritual journey of learning, like, well, what do I mean to me? What is me? Who am me? You know, this whole mm-hmm. thing. Um, so yeah, I, I totally had uh, very, very similar, um, the spontaneous, I think I've heard you talk about it in other podcasts as well as the spontaneous, like stretching and yoga and breath work and meditation. Like you just couldn't not meditate. Like you just, you start to become, um, obsessed with it. Like what, like you can't go about your everyday life, you know, joking about, um, you know, TV commercial ads and stuff with everybody when you're just thinking about being miles away from this meta perspective of who am I and what is this? And, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Once you're, I I think it was the same thing for me. So it's funny because it's, it's both terrifying, but also so interesting, right? So you, you learn about this, this thing, you have this disassociative state and uh, you recognize it because your body is filled with fear and uh, you recognize it as kind of a defense mechanism in some ways. But then it's also like we we're talking about at the beginning, it's this weird remembering, you know, it's like when you're reading Eckhart Tolle's book, uh, th- th- he's speaking to something where you're like, I already know this in a weird way. Mm-hmm. He's, he's almost just p- repainting a picture or kind of like uncovering a picture that you think you've seen before, you know, um, and, and I do think that it's often locked behind uh, you know a lot of our our modern world is kind of um this information is hid behind spiritual texts or religious books or things and that kind of turns a lot of us off we're like i don't know about that or we only have one version of it and it doesn't include the whole thing um so yeah in, in, any sort of opening to explain I, I think that um once we start to learn about this stuff if we've had a kundalini awakening or any sort of awakening experience there is um uh, we just feel heard, like our, our real self feels heard and seen in, in, in a sense, you know, I, I, I think that uh, you're far from alone in Eckhart Tolle being one of your, you know, first spiritual teachers on the path. I know people personally, as well as there's a spiritual teacher. Um, have you heard of Aaron Abke on YouTube? Yeah, I have. Yeah. So, so he was a, um, an evangelical pastor's kid and he had a lot of similar stuff. He had a Kundalini awakening, but, um, one of his first kind of profound, he had, um, a few weeks of Samadhi and it was caused by him on his break. He's working at Google as a personal trainer and, uh, he was on his break at work listening to Eckhart Tolle audiobook. And, uh, he said it kind of like set him into this state for, for multiple weeks of just like, you know, kind of a, what we would consider an enlightened state. Um, and then he describes how, you know, he had things in his personal, you know, grounded life that happened and kind of led him out of it. But, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of where we could take it. Um, so you had this, you had this experience and then, so you're taking some time to learn about it, to read about it, trying to understand what happened to me. Um, it sounds like you becoming, um, kind of, kind of teaching people was sort of a natural thing. So how does this equate with your upbringing of what you knew of spirituality? And, um, I I think you were, did you say you were raised in Catholicism? Have I heard that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what were the things that kind of stayed from what you knew back then? Um, and what were the things that you kind of had to relearn? I mean, so, so like this different belief system, how was it different than what you had learned when you were, when you were a child? Well, it took it took me a long time to uh to make sense of some of the uh more western religions um catholicism in particular um and i'm still learning it and making more and more sense about it but in short i was raised to believe that god was up in the sky and that we were the poor lowly sinners on earth separate and we had to earn our way to connecting with God in heaven when we died. Um, And by default, we were shameful, unworthy sinners, you know, original sin and that sort of thing. And so when I began to understand, you know, I I recognized, well, there are people like Eckhart Tolle who are living in a very heightened state of consciousness and they haven't died. They're still here. So I thought, you know, to hell with this Western idea of God being up in the sky. I let it all go. I became uh, rather um, resentful of it for the shame, the guilt, the lies, um, the uh, the mass manipulation that I was seeing. You know the uh, the the industry of of organized religion. Mm. Um, but but coming back uh, around, I, I came to see that 
at least in my, you know, it's a general statement here, but it seems that all of these organized religions were formed around a mystic who had recognized that God wasn't up in the sky, that God was within. And they began to, you know, share a message of that. And that message became watered down and used to, you know, control with fear or manipulation and whatnot. And so if we look at, uh, you know, Christianity, Jesus was a mystic. He was a mystic that had engaged in, in, you know, rigorous spiritual practice and devotion and recognized that he was the son of God. In other words, he was in a state of union with God, which is what yoga is. Yoga means union with God. We look at Buddhism, the same thing. He recognized enlightenment. It's different ways and different ways of looking at it. But in a sense, the Buddha was also a mystic. And so I said, well, instead of worshiping these people, I can do my best to try and move towards what they had realized, like Eckhart Tolle. And then I began to find that there were people all over the world that were living in these, you know, mystical states teaching about it. And so that's, you know, snapped me out of this idea that, um, you know, God was separate up in the sky. Instead, I said, okay, you know, I'm not going to focus on religion. I'm going to focus on spirituality. And I think it was Deepak Chopra who said, religion is about someone else's experience. Spirituality is about your experience. And that's where my attention mm -hmm. went. It went to uh, it being about my experience. And so I, after that experience of meditation, I, like I said, I didn't make much of it, that, that sort of energetic experience with my spine moving. I didn't make much of it. I didn't really know what that was. It, didn't, it wasn't really notable to me. Um, but I just continued practicing mindfulness throughout my day. Um, eventually, it, it moved from trying to overcome depression because I think I had gotten a lot of, I made a lot of progress on those fronts. Then it became to, I, I said, well, I can continue these practices and move towards something like enlightenment or mysticism or yoga, union with the divine. And, and so I continued on those with those practices. But for a long time, there was no energetic component after that. It was solely um, to do with with these with with abiding as uh, mindful awareness. There wasn't very much of an energetic component that came. It reemerged later on in my journey. Mm. How so? How did it reemerge? Are you talking about um, when you're so like your Kundalini energy actually did? Did you have an experience where it kind of shot through the top of your head? Did you experience that? Okay, cool. Yes. Will you explain yeah. how, how that happened and, and what that was like for you? My, mine was a bit different. I never had um, the shooting experience from the base of my spine to the top of my head. I had similar experiences with other um, what I would consider like chakra points. Um, mm -hmm. But 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 first, how was it for you? What was it like for you? Yeah. So so just for uh, for your audience out there, you may be wondering, you know, uh, part of my work here is to dispel the notion that Kundalini awakening must require a huge energetic rising of the spine. For many, it happens in, in more subtle, gradual ways. I like to say that this is the divine, and the divine doesn't just move in one direction from root up to the top of the head. Many people also have energetic unfoldings that happen downwards. Some people have, maybe like you said, various chakra points at different different periods on their path begin to come activated and whatnot. So it looks very different for, for almost anyone. And many people are going through Kundalini awakening. They don't even know it mm -hmm. because they're saying, oh, I didn't have a huge rising um, up my spine. And so I just want to preface with that because I, I, I in fact, did have a, a massive rising up my spine um, of this Kundalini awakening, this Kundalini energy. So at, at age 15, that's when I had this meditation experience where the spine started to do that spontaneous movement. It lasted maybe about 30 seconds. I came out of this meditation, went around, went along with my day. Um, it was later on at, I mean, three, or three years later or so, it's 2012. And at this point, I've been, I've been working towards this idea of self-realization, of, of enlightenment as a result of what I had learned uh, through Eckhart Tolle, I began to explore more and more traditions from the East. And I began to engage in what's called self-inquiry, um, inquiring into, you know, who am I? I was also asking, what is true? What is true? Uh, in a very intense way. Mm. Um, because these are, I, these are practices that come out of, of Zen, like koans, um, uh, Advaita Vedanta, 
Mm-hmm. Um, if you're, maybe some people are familiar with uh, Ramana Maharshi, he had to practice self inquiry. Who am I? So I thought I'll continue these these practices and just see what what happens. Well, eventually something significant happened. I was I was asking, you know, what is true? And suddenly it dawned on me, nothing is true. This is all arising in consciousness like a dream, including myself. And with this experience, there was like an energetic opening in my head. Um, It felt like my head became so spacious. And in my head, it was completely empty. There was no sense of identity of Brent, the ego, the me, I. There were thoughts, but I recognized that the thoughts were just, there was initially a void and a thought would arise. Then that thought would pass away back into the void. And then another thought would arise. And I saw all this is, is just thoughts arising one at a time. That's not, that's not me. It's quite literally just one thought arising at a time. There's no center there that I could say, okay, yeah, this is me. This is I, this is Brent. This is the ego. This is myself. And so this was interesting. There was a significant shift. I knew it was of a spiritual nature. Um, and there's an energetic component as well. I, I didn't use those terms initially. Looking back, I see that there was a significant energetic component where the, the crown chakra or the head opened up and a lot of consciousness flowed inwards into my head. Um, and so I was abiding in this sort of uh, what some may call a non-dual state. There was no duality here. It was... Uh, it wasn't oneness per se, but it was just, it was not two-ness. It's a difference there. It's very subtle, but there's just not two-ness. I knew that if I'm not, if there's no actual entity called Brent here, well, then how can what I take myself to be be separate from anything else? If for, in order for separation to be here, well, this idea of Brent would have to be here to be separate from the world. And so there was this experience of like, well, I'm one with everything. But with that, Similarly to my dissociative states as a young child, I, f- I was out of my body. My head became so big, almost like it had no no top on it anymore. And I was like almost watching myself like a, from a third eye perspective, almost like a bird's eye view. I was just watching the body and the world. And I noticed that you know, it was all like a very spooky dream that was unfolding on its own. Everything was happening automatically, even the processes within my, within my own body, because I wasn't in control. It was just happening. And there was um, incredible insights coming here. I recognize that this is what they mean when the Tao is flowing and everything is the Tao manifesting and expressing it's just the flow. And I saw the flow so intensely in this place. And so up until this point, I was exploring teachings from like Zen Buddhism, um, uh, Neo Advaita, which is like a modern offshoot of, of Advaita Vedanta, which is a more older uh, tradition from the East, from, uh, from uh, the Vedic, uh, the Vedic wisdom. And so their philosophies were very much philosophies that describe the nature of reality as being like an illusion, as being consciousness, as being awareness. And so it was very much a philosophical approach that felt very cerebral, intellectual, um, very mind-based. And so I thought, well, this must be what they're talking about when they, they speak about enlightenment. I've recognized that I don't exist. I'm not separate from anything. Everything is happening on its own. This is the Tao. I'm not in my body. I'm watching my body. And I, and in that place, I felt extremely numb. Uh, no emotional experience practically whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I've, I'm free from emotions now. I'm free <laughs> from all the suffering that I was going through all this time. Uh, it felt, okay, you know, something is a little weird here. And then I said, okay, well, maybe I'll just take some time and I'll get used to this new state. And then this will be my life now. Free from emotions, just watch my body. I'll be one with the Tao. And so that's where I, there were some, some challenges there. I, I could talk a little bit about it as well, because um, I did eventually come across 
a, a text that described depersonalization, uh, also called DPDR, deep, depersonalization, derealization, mm. and Zen sickness or emptiness sickness, in which they describe that some people uh, within Zen, for example, if they're meditating a lot, they can experience the Zen sickness where they become depersonalized and they feel like everything has become a dream. And I thought, oh, this is actually what I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. Zen sickness. Something is not complete here. Something is a little off. And so from there, I said, okay, this must not be the final stage. Clearly, this is a documented experience. And so I got to figure out how to, how to cure myself of Zen sickness. And I... I thought, you know, I had a Buddhism teacher uh, in a, a university course, not uh, not a spiritual teacher, a professor, I should say, professor. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe they'll have some answers for me. So I approached them and said, hey, you know, I'm I'm experiencing Zen sickness, and I remember talking to them, feeling completely out of my body. And uh, she said, oh, you know, that's interesting, but honestly, I can't help you. Oh, I don't she, know much about this. Had she heard this. about it at all? She. I, I from what I could tell, she hadn't heard about Zen sickness, and she wasn't a practiced meditator. I think she had a more of an interest in the cultural implications of Buddhism, um, the ethical uh, and cultural implications, and that was her focus. Mm -hmm. But when it came to the direct in the experience of the individual who's practicing these these uh, you know these spiritual traditions, mm -hmm. um, meditation, I, she admitted, I, "I can't help you. I don't practice this." Could could I ask I, you, Brent, how, yeah. how this made you feel? And this it seems important to ask, like when you opened up to her about this thing, like, hey, I'm going through this, like, um, you know, an insane thing that I, you you're probably barely able to put words around, and you just assume like she probably she could probably help me, you know, she she knows about this stuff. I've heard her mention Zen before, ever, you know, whatever. And then then when she was like, I don't know about it, how, how did that make you feel? Did that send you backwards at all? Or yeah, it was. Uh... It was horrifying. It was quite literally horrifying because in within Zen sickness, within what I was experiencing, I felt like everything was a dream. I felt like nothing was real, nothing was true. And so when I read about Zen sickness, I thought, okay, so maybe, maybe I'm not actually alone in this dream and there are actual people out there that can help me get back to feeling real again. And so when I approached her and she gave me this response, I can't help you, Brent, it further validated my mindset or my perspective or what had happened to me in that I felt, wow, I am alone. And she is like a character in my dream. Mm. Um, that's what a character would say, you know, if you're in a dream and you try to say, hey, buddy, we're dreaming. They'd say, no, we're not. Uh -huh. Or even if you said, hey, can you help me get out of this dream? They say, what do you mean? Where do you want to go? Right. They won't, they won't have anything for you. Right. Yeah. What dream? What do you mean? And so it was like, okay, you know, she's saying, I can't help you. Um, and I could tell she felt a little embarrassed because, I mean, here she is professor of Buddhism, unequipped to help me. Mm -hmm. And so out of her, I think her embarrassment, I think she tried to save a little bit of face by saying, you know, I just moved here from Chicago. If we were back in Chicago, I would have maybe recommended, a, um, you know, like a Zen teacher but I don't know anybody here. Mm. And so I said, okay, you know, why don't I figure out where the closest Zen place is? Um, and they can help me. Uh, the, like a Zen monastery or something. There's got to be something. I'm, I'm, I was in uh, Toronto. And so I found a, a Zen center. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll make my way over there. So it was a, a long bus ride. I remember being on the bus, looking around at everyone's face. And just thinking, you know, they have no idea what I'm going through. Like they have no idea what just happened to my mind. My mind was quite literally blown apart. Um, my entire perception of the world has been shattered. And these people are just, you know, going about their day. And I remember sitting there as a very interesting contrast. Eventually, I found myself to the Zen center and I, I, I walk up to the door and I knock on the door. It's like this old sort of estate house type, type thing. A man opens the door and I say, hey, look, man. I think I'm going through Zen sickness. I need help. I I don't know what's wrong. Um, and I but I know that something is wrong. Um, and he says, Oh, you know, the teacher's not here. 
Mm. And uh, to be honest, they don't really help people off the street. And I thought, oh my God, you know, another, uh, you know, dead end. Um, and he says, you know, give me a second. And he comes back, he gives me a paper and it's like a mental health crisis hotline. So it's call these people, they'll help you. And I remember looking at this and thinking, man, this is spiritual. This is a spiritual crisis or emergency that I'm going through. I don't think I had those words yet, but I knew that this wasn't solely mental illness. Hmm. This was spiritual in nature because it coincided so closely with what I had read as descriptions of these awakenings and experiences of Satori and ego death and no self. It was consistent with those experiences. And so I knew if I call these people, they may not, they may be even less equipped than my Buddhist teacher or less equipped than even this guy who was maybe practicing Zen. I don't know if he was a teacher or not, but even he couldn't even give me any word of advice. I don't know what somebody on a mental health crisis is going to say to me when I say, hey, I feel like, you know, I'm a dream. My mind has been blasted open. I don't have an ego or I, I've mm -hmm. seen through my ego. Now, what are they supposed to say to me, right? And so I thought, this is spiritual in nature. And I took stock. I said, well, somehow I came across that term Zen sickness. Something is orchestrating this unfolding. And I tuned in and I felt the Tao, the flow of the Tao, the flow of life. And I said, that is taking care of me. It's directing me further on my journey. I just need to acknowledge that I haven't yet landed and arrived. A significant shift has taken place, but I need to keep going and following whatever is supported me this thus far. Because I thought it was a great gift to even have come to realize what Zen sickness was. Um, I, I forgot to mention it, but in my university course, the Buddhism course, I didn't do any of the readings. I was so busy with trying to become enlightened. <laughs> but for some reason during this Zen sickness experience when my head was blasted open, at some point I just grabbed the book, the textbook, opened it to a random page and there was Zen sickness, emptiness sickness. And there was a description. And that's when I recognized what was going on. And so I thought, well, something inspired me to open the book. Clearly that was the flow, the Tao, mm -hmm. my intuition, something, some intelligence is orchestrating my unfolding. I can trust that intelligence. I can surrender. It was not easy. I was like, what else do I got? I mean, people can't help me. I went to the Zen center. They can't help me. What am I supposed to do but trust? And so I put all my faith in this intelligence that was, you know, that seemed to be holding me and coaxing me to keep going. And with that surrender, I had to let go of this belief that, you know, I had, I had reached full enlightenment and uh, be humble enough to continue forward on the journey. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's so incredible. I mean, I think, uh, I think many would probably, uh, relate to, you know, you picking up this book and you turn to the page and suddenly it's kind of speaking about what you're talking about. I have, uh, I've had conversations on the podcast and with friends, um, who have had the experience of going to the library and like a book fell off the shelf and that's the book that they needed to buy or, or, or check out, you know, so interesting. Um, wow. I mean, yeah. So I, I felt it important to ask how you felt in that moment um, when you kind of like, okay, there's a, clearly this thing going on with me. Someone's going to help me. I'm going to go to them and I'm going to tell them what's going on. And she's like, uh, man, I don't know. You know, I, I, I haven't experienced that. I don't know. Um, Cause it, for my journey, it was also, I, I think that I had a lot of the similar thing of, I would have moments where I'm kind of explaining these things to people or I'm talking about them and I'm rambling on about, oh, I'm, I'm having this and I'm having depersonalization. I'm using these words that not only they don't know, but then I kind of like get present with the moment and with this person, you know, whether it's been like a friend or just someone I've met. Um, and I realize they don't know what the heck I'm talking about. And then it's like this, oh no, yeah, you really are alone. You know, that snapping out a reminder that, you know, this is a, in a sense, a dream world, you know, and, and it's not to, um, uh, you know, negate the, the teachers or, or friends who are there. Like they just simply don't know they love us and they want us to feel okay too, but, um, they don't know what you're talking about. Like if, if you haven't experienced it to like, 
hear these things, it's just so far removed from our everyday waking life that it's very difficult to understand, you know? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think, um, so, okay. So, so how would you say that, I mean, it seems like you kind of fell back on your path of, okay, I have to find the answers for what this is. Like I have to find what's true to me. So you're going through this, you have um, what you would consider a Zen sickness. You're having a Kundalini awakening. Um, I'm not sure if at this time, if you knew that, if, if you would consider it that, or you had that terminology, no. Um, so, so how did you begin to stabilize yourself af- after all of this? You know, what, what, what started making things more normal? Because what, what I noticed, something that's um, wonderful to point out is it's not like you just tried to forget about all of it and tried to go back to your everyday, you know, nine to five sort of picket fence life. Um, you were able to integrate this, you were able to keep this wonderful information, but also become more grounded, you know, and I'm sure that your everyday waking life talking with people who are unawakened is, is a completely normal part of your experience now, you know, it's because I think that um, when we're going through these things, we're like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to talk to a normal person again. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to like, I can't go back to a a job. You know, this is this is so far fetched. But um, I mean, it seems that seems that you have integrated these things and stabilized yourself. So what was the next step on your journey, Brent, of, um, um, I, I guess, in integrating all, all of this? Because it seems like you've done so well. You know, it seems like now you're able to take the things that you've experienced and, you know, you're a spiritual teacher now and, and you're helping a lot of people who stumble across your videos. So, I mean, what was that jump like? How did you get to where, you know, kind of where you are now, so to say? Yeah, great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it, it's, it's been a very long journey. So this initial experience took place in 2012. So it's been about 10 years of integrating that experience, as well as others that, uh, you know, we can get into as well. But that experience, um, going back to when we were talking about Kundalini awakening, and how it can move in different directions, it can be subtle, it can be intense, it can look very different. I would describe this as a top down awakening. So there's the idea of the energy rising from the root upwards, but then some people can have this like top down experience where the crown is what initially has that in pour of, of energy. And it could bring about a lot of um, interesting shifts in perception, uh, shifts in the way that we we view our own ego and, and that sort of thing that I've been describing thus far. So it was a top down awakening that I was experiencing. Now, I didn't know that it was a top down experience. I thought that was the whole thing. Because like I said, the traditions that I was exploring were very much only based about on the head. They didn't openly talk about integration and embodiment like you've been describing. So I recognized that I was going through a spiritual unfolding. And I recognized I have to be humble and keep going as opposed to thinking that it's done. Still, I recognize that there's a maturation process, an integration process, an embodiment process that has to follow in some respects. So I think around this time, a few days later, or maybe maybe even the same day, I can't remember. But um, prior to this, I was I was eating a vegan diet. Um, My intention was to support my spiritual awakening. And I thought this was the best, uh, the best sort of diet for that. And so when I realized everything was a dream, I said, what's the point of being a vegan? Like, it's all a dream. I, I can eat meat, get all this diet stuff. And so I, I grabbed, uh, there's, I opened my fridge, you know, I had some, some pork chop in there. I fried it up, ate this pork chop, really enjoyed it. In hindsight, I can tell that eating the meat was very grounding for me. It, it brought me a little bit, bit more into my body. This, this awakened consciousness began to settle a little bit deeper in my body. Just from eating that pork chop, it made a big difference, especially because leading up to that, I hadn't touched meat in a while. So energetically, meat is a very grounding food. It's not for everybody. Um, Some people, it's best that they avoid it. But for some, I think, myself included, it's 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 necessary to keep me, uh, you know, in the world, in my body. So that was one thing that I feel like I was inspired to eat meat. I didn't think, oh, I'll eat meat to ground myself. I just said, you know, for it's all a dream. Who cares? So I ate the meat. Then I'm, I mean, I'm still out of my body. But uh, I thought, okay, you know, if this, if this is my life now, you know, being out of my body, I got to learn how to operate in this state. Because, you know, it, it, if an awakening took place, I got to figure out how to navigate and go through, you know, learn this new way of functioning with the flow, 
um, and whatnot. And so I thought, I saw, I said, you know, why don't I go to one of those yoga classes? Just see what it's like to move being out of my body. Let's see what it's like to just kind of experience this. It was kind of like I had a, a it's like I was playing a video game, like I had a controller and my body was like a third person character out there. So it's kind of like that. So I said, okay, you know, maybe yoga is where I should go. I'll just see what happens. So I went to a yoga class. And, um, you know, the teacher's saying, you know, bring your attention to your breath and the belly, feel your feet on the ground, slowly move your arms upward, bend over, et cetera, et cetera. So after the class, I found myself feeling a little bit more in my body. So eventually I began to understand that if I bring attention to my body, I can come into my body. And over the next few years, I just began to kind of work on this a, a little bit, uh, not very intensely. It was almost like an organic unfolding, mm -hmm. but I recognized that the more I brought attention to my body, the more I settled into my body. And yet I didn't lose this idea of everything being interconnected. I didn't lose the sense of not being mm. able to find a sense of rent in my mind. I still couldn't, but I recognized the more I come into my body, I still have to call myself Brent and function in the world as an individual, even though I had this massive experience prior that showed me that it's all one. My job isn't to like go sit under a tree and just say everything is one. I, you know, especially because I'm young, I recognize I have so much life ahead of me. I got to, you know, establish myself in the world. Um, and then from there, I recognized I um, I began to feel these emotions in my heart again. I was very numb, but eventually I started to feel things in my heart and they weren't necessarily pleasant. I started to feel anger at times flowing through me in a like really intense ways like never before. Mm. And and it was like visceral and I felt alive like like never before. Um and and so my relationship with my emotions began to change. Um, and I went through having to understand that emotions aren't a problem just because you've had a spiritual awakening or some sort of spiritual experience doesn't mean you're not a human being that's not able to get angry or upset or triggered or jealous or any of these things. And so I began to explore ideas of re reinventing my relationship with my own emotional experience. And I gave myself permission to feel those things. And from there, there was a deep, deep sadness and melancholy in my heart. And the sadness was a deep desire for God to be in my heart. This is the only way that I can describe it. A deep desire for God to be in my heart. I felt, you know, I have known God, the divine spiritual nature of reality. I've known this on my mind in this cerebral way this philosophical way. And it quite literally did blast my mind open, but I'm not feeling it. Mm -hmm. I'm not feeling it in my body, in my heart. And so I began to feel this like deep longing and sadness and melancholy that was somewhat pleasant. I don't know if you're familiar with what I mean when I say there's something a little pleasant about melancholy. Mm, yeah, lo longing is a perfect word that you use because there yeah. is like a like I've experienced this before. I know that it's true, but I just don't feel it right now. You know, something like that. Yeah, it's something about the pace of it. It's slow. It's it's poetic or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it felt warm, and I just decided to sit with this and just be with it. And so my meditation practice reemerged and it went from being this like very psychological or intellectual or mind-based meditation of just witnessing thoughts to just feeling this intense love and longing in my heart. And from there, I would meditate lying down. And I would just feel this and I would feel my spine kind of becoming um, spontaneously moving again, like how it did when I initially was meditating that very first time the spine would kind of flow and it wasn't for some reason i didn't get afraid of it at this time i just let it happen it just felt like i should just let it happen it was kind of just this gentle spinal bending 
this wasn't yet the major rising experience, but I could tell that now my awakening was moving into my body. And it was within the context of relationships that helped me to integrate as well. Excuse me. So you're asking about how I had spent, you know, what, what I had done to integrate in a body. Well, I used relationships as a context. And so I thought, it doesn't matter how awakened I am. It doesn't matter if I've seen, you know, beyond my ego or whatever, you know, airy fairy ideas I have. I mean, how deeply can I relate with somebody? Mm-hmm. Can I attract a partner and keep that partner and have a meaningful and deep relationship? And I, if I can be honest, that was challenging. Um, you know, I would maybe have, and it wasn't even just in a romantic sense, but, you know, I'd have challenges with, with my family, with, with my parents, with, uh, my friends, emotional things were coming up and I recognized I got work to do. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what happened to me in 2012, my mind being blasted open, you know, I'm, I'm dysfunctional in my relationships. Um, you know, relationships are hard. I, I, and I just mean I'm dysfunctional and I don't like this. I, I feel like I could do better. That's mm-hmm. basically where I was coming. I feel like I could do better um, for myself and for the other people. And so I found relationship was bringing up a lot of contact, uh, emotional contacts for me to work through and process and contemplate uh, things like insecurity, sadness, um, you know, anxiety, jealousy, um, attachment, aversion. Um, judgments, all of these things were coming up emotionally. And this processing, it helped me to come into my body as well, because the way I understood it is that emotions are felt in the body. So when we talk about embodying our spiritual awakening experiences, it happens in the body. And we, that, it, it very much has to do with um, our relationship with emotions. And so this didn't mean that I was trying to get to a point where I never experienced negative emotions. No, I just wanted to get to a point where I would stop judging myself for having them using mm-hmm. spiritual ideas like spirituality means always being peaceful. So those ideas began to uh, um, be challenged. Eventually, I gave myself permission to feel more and more. And I considered this to be the practice of self-love, unconditional self-love. So it was like I was loving myself as if I was my own child coming to me and crying and saying, hey, you know, this happened to me. I feel sad. And I said, that's okay. It's okay that you feel this way. I'm not here to tell you don't feel that way. I'm not here to talk myself out of feeling those ways with spiritual philosophy. Feel it fully. You have full permission. Mm. And this was my approach of self-love. And from there, negative thoughts were arising. Thoughts that seemed to contradict all of my spiritual awakening up until that point. I'm a victim. I hate the world. The world hates me. I'm separate, blah, blah. And I thought, it's okay for you to think that way. It's okay. I'm not here to talk myself out of these thoughts based in separation or based in the illusion of the ego or false beliefs or whatever. No, have these thoughts. You're welcome here. And so I established a safe container for myself in my practice where I would just lay down hands in my heart and feel, think, anything that would arise. And in, during those periods, I would overcome a lot of challenges and my spine would kind of move here and there. But still, this wasn't even the major uh, major rising experience. So we could get to that in a bit, but I'm curious if anything's come up for you based on yeah. what I shared. I know I, I shared a whole lot. No, no, I love it. I, I thank you so much. I, I want to let you keep ripping because I feel like you're making so many wonderful points. This, um, I think this is a huge, important part for anybody who's listening. If they, they're going through any sort of um, similar experience as this is, is the allowing period. You know, you, you really like took time to allow those things. So we can live so much in the head, so much in the crown and the third eye chakra that, um, you know, integrating like the 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 real feel, feelings of of being in a body, jealousy and in in anger and uh, you know resentment and and uh, just all all these things that are so human to feel, and uh, a lot of the times our quarrel becomes not allowing them. Our quarrel becomes um, uh, uh, like making ourselves feel so guilty and shameful for even having these feelings. And you're like, well, I thought that I was like this enlightened dude now, you know, like I shouldn't be feeling anger and um, you know, here you are nonetheless. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, I think um, what, what is a huge part that took me a while to uh, 
it helped me give grace to myself was, man, if, if I, like there was a time in my life where I was feeling all these things and I wasn't aware of them. I was just acting through them and like, right. whoa, I must, I must actually, if I give myself the grace of realizing that now that I'm aware of all these things, now I can, I can allow them to be, and I can make a different choice. You know, meditation gives you that little, that little gap to think something, but act in a, in a different way. So, okay, cool. Now that I'm aware of all these things, I can realize they don't define me. They're not who I am, but I also don't have to act on those things, you know? So maybe in, in relationship and in a romantic relationship, okay, here's, here's jealousy rather than like just saying that thing, you know, rather than just expressing the jealousy and, you know, getting caught up in the same karmic loop, being able to, to see the jealousy happen in my body, be able to see the anger going on, being able to feel the anger and in, in the, you know, resentment or whatever it is rising from my heart. It's like, okay, well, all right, that's what that feels like in the body. This is part of the experience, you know, and you can kind of tap in, uh, it seems like to the, to the crown chakra, to the third eye chakra of realizing the truth of the thing and then connecting with like the acceptance, you know, the acceptance of it. It's okay that this is here. It's, it's all right. Just, just let it be. And there is almost this like unclenching of the fist when you allow something, you know, the, um, uh, one of the four noble truths in Buddhism is, is acceptance, right? So uh, it's, it, it becomes this profound thing of allowing yourself to be so human, allowing yourself to consume the meat, you know, uh, allowing yourself to th these other energy centers in our body, um, you know, they deserve just as much, uh, um, they deserve to be here just as much as, as, as the higher chakras, right? So, um, yeah, okay. So, man, th that's so great. I feel like uh, there's so many similarities uh, in my journey with, with what you're expressing. And um, it just excites me because I think that there's probably people who are listening who, um, you know, m might feel heard heard and seen in the same way. Okay, so I would love to hear about the the um the release of the, that you had of this so like what what was your step after this so you're becoming aware um you're allowing these things um you're not it doesn't seem like you're suffering as deeply in in this moment um, correct me if i'm wrong but it seems like you mm -hmm. feel like you're making some progress you're integrating the the spiritual version of yourself as well as the grounded um just just human experience that you have going on you're not rejecting one or the other that's a huge thing i think for many years i was like I've got to be spiritual. I've got to be the meditator. I've got to be the, like, I, I can't have lust. I can't uh, give in, and give in to my, you know, to, like just making my feel, myself feel shameful for eating Doritos or something, you know, like just uh, this, this allowing this integration of the, the above and the below. It seems like this is kind of where you're at in your journey here that you're explaining. So um, what was this next step? What was this explosion of energy for you, Brent? Yeah, so this laid this phase that I just described laid the foundation upon which I was being prepared to go through now a real uh even more deeper and powerful awakening and integration period. So around this time like I've said, you know, my spine is kind of moving. I'm not looking into it much. I'm just letting it happen. For whatever reason, I, I don't uh, make much of it. I'm just loving myself, hands in my heart, feel, think, doesn't matter. It's all welcome here. And around this time, I began to connect online with uh, some spiritual teachers that you know had YouTube videos and whatnot, and and they were talking about what we would call shakti. Um, also known as Kundalini Shakti, which was this energetic component of awakened consciousness. And they were talking about it. And I was also listening to some teachers that uh, had Kundalini awakenings, but didn't talk about the awakenings themselves, the Kundalini experience. But instead, they talked about being a human being and being willing to experience the thoughts and the emotions and go through the different stages of life, et cetera. And, and I, I can name those teachers. I was, I was listening to uh, Ram Das, who I know you're familiar with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much. And um, Matt Kahn. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're teachers that have a very heart centered approach. 
Um, you know, like you were speaking, you know, earlier, you know, you may have uh, used spirituality against yourself. Uh, you know, I can't eat the Doritos. Uh, that's not spiritual or whatever it is. But th these guys, you know, they, they never seem to imply that we should use spirituality against ourselves. Come as you are to the path and it's okay. It's it's welcome. In fact, the path is welcoming and accepting yourself as you are with your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Mm -hmm. And so I was hanging out with these teachers that were talking about these things. And there was a couple others. Um, one of them I like, uh, his name is David Sparrow. Uh, he was talking about Kundalini. I'll be honest, I didn't even know what the hell this guy was talking about. I would just listen to the videos and just kind of go into a sort of meditative state. And I would just listen. I don't even know what he's talking about. I don't know Kundalini. I don't know what he's talking about. Just listening. For some reason, I would just draw into these videos and I'm just listening. And I would listen to Matt Kahn and he would talk a lot about, like I was saying, using relationships as the context for our awakening and not feeling like we're a victim. Um, Ram Das, of course, would talk so, so much about, you know, being in the heart and loving God. And, and tell very human stories. And he was so vulnerable as well, as well at times about some of his own shortcomings as a teacher. And so I was hanging out in the vicinity of these teachers. I would say that looking back, I was hanging out in their energy fields, even it was transmitting and radiating through video, through audio, it doesn't matter. It's, it's transcends uh, the limitations of the physical. And in their fields was this radiance of Shakti, it was this radiance of Kundalini. And like I said, I didn't know about any of that. So I'm just enjoying their teachings, living them out. I eventually um, connect with, uh, I began dating a girl and um, the relationship was, was very mystical and wrapped up in a lot of synchronicity, these, these odd coincidences and serendipity. And, you know, um, just, just a lot of interesting stuff that seemed to imply that I had found my way into the spiritual, perfect relationship, you know, the spiritual, you know, like a peak of all relationships is what I felt like. Um, soulmates, whatever you want to call it. That's what it felt like. It felt like the Tao had brought me here, the flow, the universe had brought us both together. We seemed to both know it and recognize it. There was a lot of synchronicity that seemed just undeniable um and it all just made sense and when i say synchronicity i don't mean you know just texting each other at 11 11 i mean like just layers and layers of deep meaning like some sort of blockbuster movie and when we were together this this energy in my body would become activated and i felt energetic phenomena and i just kind of let it happen it kind of just felt like well this is what of course, I'm with I'm with my soulmate. Of course, the energy in my body and my chakras are going to do all this opening, and of course, I'm going to have these things. And I, 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 it was just very mystical and magical, and and um, the relationship went went really, really deep, very very quickly. And I was on the top of the world. Finally, I loved myself with self love to the point where I was able to attract this partner. And of course, they say you know if you want to attract a great partner. Love yourself first, overcome your uh, you know your, your neediness, find confidence, et cetera. Love yourself if you want somebody else to love you. I'm like, I did it. And this is proof. Here I am in this relationship. You know, I made it. Uh, her and I um, decided to explore um, psilocybin along with another friend as well who was also you know, very much uh, in, in wrapped in this spiritual uh, journey of us together and um you know it's interesting because i've done a, a lot of work on kundalini um on my channel and i actually haven't told this story uh in the detail that i'm about to tell it so uh it's exciting for me i was you know waiting for uh, for the right time Excellent. um and so <laughs> so so together we uh you know we take a little bit of these uh psilocybin mushrooms and now if i can preface here a lot of people do mushrooms, a lot of people do drugs, very few have a kundalini awakening. And I'm not saying this to uh, come across as arrogant. I'm saying it just as a warning for those who may be listening and saying, I'll do it and I'll have a kundalini awakening. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 A lot, a lot of spiritual practice, like I've mentioned, has gone in. Um, I was already in the midst of having energetic phenomena without the uh the mushrooms so uh i just want to clarify that they're powerful tools useful tools but um 
not for everybody. Okay. Um, and so, and of course, you know, there's all the, uh, the health and legal issues, et cetera. Um, but, um, so we, we begin this trip and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the experienced one here. And so I feel a little bit of, uh, like I'm the guide mm-hmm. and we're hanging out, um, in, uh, you know, the bedroom there and I'm in the middle of the bed and uh, they decide, you know, we're going to go grab a glass of water or something. And so they leave the room. Uh, and I'm in the middle of the bed there, hands in my heart, just loving myself, saying, I love you, over and over with each breath. And I feel simultaneously that I'm being held and that I'm holding myself. It's like I'm holding someone else and someone else is holding me, but it's still me and I'm, I'm you know, I'm really with myself. And I'm really going deep. I mean, this is the practice that I was doing even before, like I described, you know, hands in my heart. And I'm just loving this. It feels incredible. I'm held by God. I'm held by myself. I am God. I'm a child. I'm nobody. I'm everything. It's incredible. And suddenly I have a thought, an anxious thought. Oh, no, they're they're gone. You know, they've been, I don't know how long they've been gone. You know, I thought time can get a little weird on those experiences. I don't know how long they've been gone. Maybe something's happened. Maybe they're, you know, somebody got hurt. I need to go check on them. I need to leave this incredible state that I'm in and go check on them. And I hear a voice that says, hey, whatever's taking care of you right now, Brent, it's taking care of them too. So just, just relax. And so I said, all right, I could trust that. And so I went deep into this meditation again, you know, just saying, I love you over and over. I love you. And in the background, I was playing music by Ott, uh, O-T-T. It's like a sort of a Sibian side dub type of artist, um, similar to Spongel, if you're familiar with Spongel, but uh, like trippy hippie music. So I, I'm, I'm just really in this this incredible experience um, in this room here, and and uh, our friend, she's got a, she's an artist, she got a lot of cool art, and so I'm in a pretty uncomfortable place. And, uh, you know, I'm doing this practice. I love you. I'm just feeling it so fully. My heart is growing and growing. And suddenly, I feel my spine arch. And it was like this explosion of energy from the base of my spine up my spinal column in two huge jolts like that and it was orgasmic it was orgasmic times a thousand (laughs) and i can only describe it as a freight train moving at light speed squeezing itself through the shaft in my spinal column all the way up to the top of my head exploding out of my head and I found myself in this vast spaciousness and you know it was like this incredible relief was here as well and so uh, I came back out of this experience after I don't know how long but here I am in the room and you know, I, I was like, oh my God, you know, whoa. <laughs> and I recognized, whoa, I'm alone. I, I, I thought I was quite literally having sex with my partner. <laughs> and I look at my, my, uh, you know, my, my clothing and I'm completely dry. You know, I thought I had had a, had a release. <laughs> I thought, what the heck was that? Like, that was some really intense orgasm that I had that blasted me up you know, out of my body into the ethers. Holy moly. And so then soon after they, they return back into the room and I'm looking at them and I can't tell who I am anymore. I'm like, did I just come in the room? Like, who are, who are we? And they're looking at me saying like, 
I don't know who we are. Like, am I you? Are you me? Mm. We're all one. We are, we all were experiencing this, this unity type consciousness type experience of open hearted love, but it was, I mean, I can look back at it now and say it was debilitating in the sense that I didn't know who I was. Like I could have been anybody in the room, mm. um, which was fascinating. It was incredible. Um, but I just want to clarify that because some may be thinking, well, that's the way that we need to, that's the state that we need to get to. Right. So operate in the world. I'm mean, no, you can't operate in the state. You, you gotta have a sense of separation. But in the moment, it was like this total dissolution of, of uh, ego and oneness and connection. The three of us. And so, um, so they, sorry, sorry, Brett. So ahead. they were experiencing this too. Like they were the, the they oneness. Were all, yeah. See, so yeah, I think that's so fascinating. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was very, very incredible. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with the psychedelic experience. Yeah. Not that the the not that the the, the psychedelics were like tricking us into experiencing that i think the psychedelics put our nervous systems in a state of being in frequency and vibration in order to experience yeah. that um it's not just a hallucination i think it's a real experience that we were having 100 because yeah. i know that people do experience these things without the use of psychedelics right um so so we had this experience and, and so you know i'm telling them you know what just happened to me i'm like you know i have this huge orgasmic explosion of my spine and uh, my partner said, you know, we were laying on the floor in the room, uh, in the next bedroom, looking up at the stucco ceiling, and suddenly there was this massive explosion of of uh, the stucco. And I just knew that it was it happened at the same time, you know, that I had this explosion. Wow. So from there, you know, we uh, we just enjoyed this experience together and, you know, eventually you come down and the oneness experience began to fade and dissolve. It was a little bit more functional, but still there was a ongoing perception, like feeling, not just in knowing, but there's a feeling of, you know, I'm connected with everything. And, um, you know, we went out uh, later that evening um for some reason i felt called uh to just eat something vegetarian uh, which was unusual for me but i just that's just what felt right um and and so we continued that that day with having like a pretty incredible interconnectedness um that was waning but uh, a deep intimacy had, had formed but uh, the next day, you know, uh, I went to say bye to this, you know, my my quote unquote, who I thought was my soulmate at the time. And and uh, I can tell that as I go to say goodbye to her, there's like this little bit of distance between us hmm. that I hadn't perceived before. And I said, oh, you know, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it's like this. Oh, it's like a hit and it's like getting punched in the chest. Like, oh, Dude, yeah. there's some distance here. Oh, what happened? And. Uh, the next uh, couple of weeks, that distance began to grow. And I was experiencing a lot of emotional unsteadiness, loopiness, anxiety, uh, feeling like, uh, like I was like kind of frantic and, and uncontrollable emotions. And I, I was mourning the end of this relationship before it was coming because I somewhat knew it was coming. Mm. And... Um, I, um, I I didn't know that this was Kundalini awakening up until this point. So I was just, I was just tripping out, feeling very emotional, ungrounded, anxious, vibrating. My body was buzzing, you know, issues with sleep and the impending end of this relationship that I could just intuitively, I just knew um, that, you know, something was going to, you know, the shoe was going to drop or something, you know, like uh, whatever. And so um, I'm, I'm at, uh, I'm working at this car dealership. I had uh, somehow found myself there and I was very new to the job. I wasn't treated well. I wasn't respected well. I wasn't trained properly. And there's three people in my department. Two guys were going on extended trips. And um, so they sit me down and they try to explain to me a long, confusing process of what I'm supposed to do while they're away to manage this parts department. And I can't handle what they're saying. I, I know that, you know, like, um, I'm, uh, 
going through this extreme emotional instability, energetic instability. I'm very ungrounded, psychological I'm a mess. This relationship went from being incredible to now suddenly this distance. And they're telling me, you know, I'm going to take a lot of responsibility on at this job that I haven't been trained for. And they're both leaving on these trips. And so I'm like, I can't handle this. Like, this is just so much that they're asking of me, plus in my state of being here. And so uh, they say, okay, are, are you, you got that? You're going to, you're going to be okay. And I just like, yeah, yeah, don't worry, man. I got you. You know, we're good. We're good. And uh, so uh, I, I get a text message from, from my girlfriend at the time. And she says, Hey, you know, Brent, um, I met up with my ex yesterday mm. and uh, you know, we're going to get back together and you and I are done. And I have this panic attack at this moment, this huge panic attack. And uh, these two guys had left to go for a smoke break. Something came over me. I find myself grabbing my jacket involuntarily. I, I look at my feet quite literally. It was like I was dissociated, but I looked down at my feet. My feet are walking out the door. And I remember thinking, I'm walking off the job. Interesting. And I walk out the door. I get on the bus. I head home. And I just sat in my room and continued to love myself because that's all I knew. It was working in the past. I just have to continue loving myself through all this ordeal. Eventually, um, I described some of the experience to a, a friend and she said, hey, you know, that sounds like Kundalini awakening. Hmm. Ram Das spoke about his Kundalini awakening. He talks about the energy rising up his spine. And I thought, oh my God, I had a Kundalini awakening. And suddenly I'm like, I was listening to these guys the whole time, you know, Ram Das. I was listening to Matt Kahn. He had a Kundalini awakening. He doesn't talk about it much. I was listening to David Sparrow and he would talk openly about Kundalini awakening. And like I said, I would just kind of listen. I wouldn't, I didn't even know what this guy was talking about. Hmm. So I'm like, oh my God, I experienced this, what I was aware of this whole time. And it took me a couple of weeks to make sense of this experience. Uh, to make to come up with what I had gone through. And suddenly I'm like, oh my God, I had a Kundalini awakening. And that explains why I'm so messed up and out of my body and, and you know, excuse me, energetically unstable and feeling all this electricity and vibrations in my body and can't sleep. Okay. And so I knew um I did a bit of research or something. I thought, okay, I'm going through a purification period. The energy is bringing up all of the un uh, addressed issues that I've been carrying in my life, much of it, maybe I thought I was over. You know, maybe I thought I had, maybe I thought I had, ex I had overcome insecurity. Nope. <laughs> I thought I had overcome grief and confusion and sadness, trauma. I thought I had addressed all of that. No. <laughs> and so I, I sat uh, in my room and I continued with the practice that I was doing before the awakening, the practice I was doing during the awakening which of course, hands in my heart, saying, I love you to whatever was arising. And intense things were coming up. Um, a lot of grief around the heartbreak, things from the past, from childhood, um, raw things, emotions without a label, without content, just raw, raw sadness, grief. And I could tell that this was something from the collective. Not that I was healing the world per se it was more like this is a collective wound that i've inherited just because i'm a human being on this earth mm -hmm. those things were rising past life memories were rising um all sorts of difficult things emotional i was crying vomiting fevers oh the fevers were intense sweating cold sweats all sorts of really challenging things but fortunately i knew what i was going through I knew it was Kundalini. Up until this point, I had developed this relationship with, like I, I was saying, the word I'm using lately has been the Tao. I had this relationship with the Tao. I knew that I was supported. It had supported me from day one just by bringing me Eckhart Tolle's book. And I just gave all my faith to it. I said, please, just like, don't drop me now. Don't abandon me now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trusting you. Like, you know, like, you know, I'm trusting that this is going to work out. It's not happening for no reason. And so, I moved through this process six weeks straight. I just meditated six, seven hours a day, not um, because I was a monk or something. It was just, I didn't know there was nothing else for me to do. The intention, the, the, the emotions were coming up so intensely. I had no other choice. I just had to sit with it. 
And I would go through a healing cycle. And when I refer to a healing cycle, I mean like a, a phase. It could be a couple of days, it could be six hours, it could be one night, it could be a weekend, whatever, where I would be processing some difficult emotions. But when that phase ended, quite literally, I felt healed, transformed, more peaceful, more spacious, more safe in my body. And so I caught on to what was going on here. I caught on. I said, every time there's a cycle of something coming up, I go through it. I come out on the other side transformed. And so I developed yeah. more and more faith and confidence in the process. And so I I continued with this process for, uh, like I said, six weeks were the most intense. Then eventually it started to get a little bit more gradual and subtle. And I felt more stable. Um, and eventually I found myself being able to look back and say, wow, you know, I think I'm through the most difficult parts of that. I think I'm stable, I'm steady, I'm calm, I'm centered. Things will still come up and things can still come up. So this happened to me back in 2015. So about eight years, I think. So things things can still come up. But up, up, from that point on, I, I caught on to the game. I understood. Mm. Um, and so there was a willingness to heal and face what I have without, you know, like I said, using spiritual bypassing or using my spirituality against myself. And so the, if I can describe the energy initially awakened up in my crown, the top of my head, then it awakened from the roots all the way up to the top of my head. So now the entire body was awakened, you could say. And I found myself abiding for the most part in my heart, which I like to call like the center because it's the center of the spiritual awakening that happens up at the top of the head, as well as the emotional and bodily awakening that happens that happens from the root. And so in the heart, I'm able to like integrate the two. And I like to think that, you know, I'm working towards more and more deeply embodying my spirituality as a human being uh, in the world. And so, um, you know, I, I can pause there and you can see, uh, but it's coming up for you. Any questions? Uh, I know it was intense. It was good to, to finally talk about it in that way. I, I was oh, waiting for the right time. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, thank you so much for sharing all that. Like, it's such a, you know, it's such an innately personal thing. But uh, like I said, I mean, and I think probably like your journey as well is when we hear other people telling about their their versions of it or like how they went through it it's like such this feeling of being heard you're like oh gosh you know like with you you're like oh wow that's what's going on a kundalini awakening like i i had one oh geez and then suddenly you kind of have a, a mile marker of sorts like you're like okay yeah. so there is a some sort of apparent direction in which I'm, I'm heading. Right. You know, so, okay. So I had this now what, you know, it's the, cause it's such a destabilizing process for, for so long, you know, and, and I think, um, uh, you know, for some of us, it, it, it varies. I mean, I, I, I've heard people talk about how it could be, um, you know, anywhere from a couple months of, of an experience to, you know, 10, 15 years of, of experiencing this. And, you know, I don't think there's a wrong way or a right way or a um, set in stone way, but I think that, um, you know, once it starts to happen, once the Kundalini begins to rise or even like the, you know, it's interesting because like very much in, in you're saying this too is, it's there's so many experiences that lead up to it that are for sure a part of it you know it's not like your kundalini awakening only starts when it rises up your spine and you have like some sort of awakening experience like for you on the psychedelics where um you know you kind of like saw this white light and it was like this orgasmic feeling through your body like that's as much the kundalini awakening as the th the things that led up to it over the, over the right. course of the few years so you know one thing that i noticed for me um I've always had this fascination with time. Like time is always so interesting to me in so many levels. Like my, um, my first eight years of, of being a DJ and performing and stuff, I went by DJ Kronos, who's the Greek Titan of time. Um, and, and I was just like, man, if I could just, you know, there's those moments where an artist on stage could make you just like time just goes by so fast. Suddenly you realize it's been 45 minutes, but you've just been transcended and transported in this way. You know, I thought I always thought that was fascinating. Um, but I, I think that it's funny because I didn't even realize my fascination with time is is like spiritual. It's uh, uh, because when these things happen to you, 
you start to realize the connectiveness of, of everything. And once you allow, um, you know, your journey to happen, you're like, oh, of course. So I had to have those things happen to me when I was a child or else I wouldn't be this version or I wouldn't be able to like, you know, speak about these versions of these things that are happening to me now. Um, yeah. So, so the, the understanding of time itself seems to, uh, kind of change when you're on a spiritual journey. And, and I don't know if it's just, just with Kundalini, Kundalini or, or awakenings or whatnot, but um, I think a lot of people can kind of resonate with seeing how the series of events that led up to the spiritual awakening and where we are now are, you know, sounds kind of cheesy, but like they're also perfect. You know, they're hundred percent. It's like like the, oh, of course, those things had to happen for me to be this integrated. Um, you know, not you know, for lack of a better term, actualized, like I'm, I'm, you know, some version of my actualized self or, um, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be on my path, you know, not, not an, an arrival of being, you know, an actualized avatar or something, but, um, yeah, it just kind of gets you to be right where you're at now. Um, wow. Okay. So now that, now that you have gone through these things, um, I think, um, I think I think for me, there was moments where uh, I was so enthralled and so like obsessed with because I, I, I had I had a similar um, where I was like, I couldn't help but meditate like for a, a long periods of time. I couldn't help but do yoga like my it was so interesting because it was such like a, a kooky, weird, insane moment of my life. But it was all I could do like so I would I'd wake up in the morning um, and luckily for a while I had this like schedule where um, I would have like long bouts of, I would have weeks or months where I'm not really working, where I'm not really having to do much, I'm not really having to be social. So I can kind of be in these esoteric realms for a long time where I'm reading a ton of philosophy, I'm listening to audiobooks, I'm like going on long runs, listening to, you know, Ram Dass or any of these spiritual teachers. And so I'm, I'm in this mindset um, and I feel like I'm, I'm not really having to be grounded in, in a sense, which is, I don't think I'd really recommend in some ways, but I think it's also how, what I had to do. Um, I would mm-hmm. walk outside. Uh, I had this wonderful backyard of like privacy and, uh, there was nature and birds and there was like tons of squirrels and like sometimes I'd be meditating and like a deer would walk right up to me where it, not like wow. touching distance, but probably like within like 15 feet and I would sense their energy or something and kind of open my eyes and realize they've just been staring at me like, what? what is going on? So I was in, um, but also at the same time I would be walking out to, to my meditation spot and I would just lean over and vomit. Like I would just throw up and, and, and like, I'm like, Oh, okay. Yep. There's my morning vomit and go sit down and meditate. And like now retrospectively, I'm looking at like, what was going on? Like I was just accepting that as normal in that moment. Mm. Um, so yeah, man, I, I, uh, just, just to, just to ramble on, I mean, it's so interesting in these experiences, they really are so far fetched, you know, and then some time comes on and you're able to kind of come down into grounded reality, you know, and uh, I, I've said this before, you might've heard me uh, repeat this over and over from Ram Dass is uh, uh, always remember your, your Buddha nature and your social security number, you know, Ram, right. Ram Dass has said that. And I always love it because that's, that's kind of part of what it was. You know, I think anybody going through an awakening, we have these these moments of being extremely spiritual or like we can't even fathom, like we can't even hold a conversation um, in, in kind of the grounded realm of things. You know, uh, I remember for me, I, I went to, uh, after the pandemic, I work in live events. And so I wasn't able to to work and make an income for a while. And so it got to the point where I was like, oh man, I need a job. Like I got to pay the bills sort of thing. And so I was working at um, uh, UPS. I was a supervisor over there. And I remember like my first few weeks, I was nervous. I was like, man, I have been, I've been on Mars for many months and now I need to like go, like I'm sending people's packages, you know, it's like a very grounded thing. And I remember um, introducing myself as Jake and they're like, oh, Jake from State Farm. And they would say like things like that, like just jokes from the TV and like, you know, just our typical. Mm. And I was like, oh no, I've got to, I'm going to need to run out of this building. I can't handle like the, like, and it took me a while. And then I would start kind of like, accepting that and joking back with them and um, talking about what, not talking about spiritual stuff, not trying to talk about God in every moment, not trying to teach everybody about meditation, but just having a silly time at work with the people I was working with. And, you know, then slowly I was able to kind of like see their beauty and I would appreciate, ah, oh, man, this person, like, they're not like me, but 
that's okay. Like they're like them and they're pretty awesome. You know, you start seeing the beauty in people. And so, yeah, there's just like this integration process of, there's a lot of fear of thinking that you're going to like lose your spiritual knowledge or like, man, I think I was up there on the mountain and I've got to descend down. And, um, I think that you've described it in your ways, Brent, like a, a beautiful way of, 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 of having both, you know, in a sense, like there's this, uh, um, I don't probably not the right term, but as above, so below, like you're, 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 you're able to kind of, um, the, the integration of being spiritual and being a grounded, a human, we're in this body, we're in this, you know, uh, meat suit and, and, and all this. Um, and, um, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that's an important part to point out because there's often points for me, um, another experience that happened for me was when I first kind of had, um, mine didn't shoot out of my head, but I had my mind connected to my heart. And it was this insane experience that like lasted multiple days of being in this, like it was disassociative, but I felt very stuck in my body. And I remember searching on online. I was just on Reddit. Even I even posted on a Reddit forum. I forget which one, um, like asking for help. And I was like, I think that I went too far. I think that I opened my third eye. I can't close it. I didn't know what I was talking about. I was literally searching up YouTube videos, how to close your third eye. <laughs> like, mm. Cause I was just so ungrounded in, in so many ways. But you know, um, now my understanding of those sorts of things, like it's not that you need to shut down one or, or add more to the other. There is like a, a natural balance and integration that, that, um, seems to happen. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. So we've still got some time left. I, I do have like, so I had, I had a couple notes for you, Brent. Um, and, and, and of course, if there's anything else you, you, you want to mention for sure, bring it in. But, um, I did, I, I was curious. So you were talking about this moment where you had this experience and you had two people around you, two people who were close and you kind of had a synchronistic, um, like you, you, you felt this, this bright white light, you, you had this orgasmic feeling and they also had some correlation of feeling the same thing. And they walk in the room and you're like, who's, like, is this my mouth? Is this your mouth? Who are you? Who am I? Yeah. This sort of like, I mean, oh, wow. How fascinating is that? Like, what an incredibly interesting thing as far as I'm concerned, you know. Um, have you, and what do you think about the, uh, have you heard of like Joe Dispenza's retreats? Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of Joe Dispenza? So, so he, I mean, it, I don't know how exactly to put it, but I think that he's basically having giant like convention center level retreats multiple days long where he's activating people's Kundalini. Um, and, and not just him, you know, I'm sure these people, their life has led them to these, this is like maybe like a self-help sort of seminar. If anybody who's listening has heard of Tony Robbins, um, I think it's, it's kind of up there with that. I think Joe Dispenza is a little more esoteric and, and a bit more intense, but Brett, what, what do you think, um, based off of your spiritual experience, what you've read, what you've gone through personally, what do you think about this fascinating thing? You know, we're having retreats of people coming together to, um, whether intentionally or not, if that's the word they use, but kind of awaken their Kundalini. Like, I mean, what, what, what do you think about that? And, and how much have you heard about any of that? Yeah. So Joe Dispenza is a fascinating guy of, uh, like a lot of admiration for him. I feel like he's one of the people who are tactful not to openly discuss Kundalini awakening um, blatantly, maybe in the way that I do, because it, mm. it, it turns off a lot of people. Mm. And I think that's conducive to why he's able to attract, like you said, convention level, convention center uh, size audiences and people from going on retreats with him around the world. Because... Um, a lot of his work centers around healing in general, mm -hmm. emotional healing, physical healing, even. So I would say that um, I, I don't know too much about his work, but I know I, I'm going to harbor a, a strong guess that he's dealing with awakened Kundalini himself. He had an interesting uh, traumatic experience and, and I've read a little bit of his work and he does refer to an energy that seems quite synonymous with Kundalini. I'm sure he must have referred to it as Kundalini uh you know, in a clear way at some point or another as well. But um, I think that what his work involves is tapping into that energy that we all have to use it for healing transformation, but doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to have uh, their Kundalini awakened per se. I think that we can all um, experience it from time to times uh, in a sort of active state, and then it goes back into sleep, into dormancy. Um, 
so it's kind of like a stirring of it or a stimulation of it or um tapping into um you know there's different ways we could look at it like uh, the life force or the chi and using that to facilitate some form of transformation but um i don't know if he approaches it as like a directly and obvious like kundalini awakening event hmm. but there are some that do um there are, are some that uh you know serve as like um at least if they're operating in a sort of indian uh tradition they would call themselves a guru and uh, some offer what's called shaktipat which is a transmission of shakti which is synonymous with kundalini it's this transmission of the spiritual power from uh, the guru to the aspirant and this can serve to awaken another's kundalini so in the same way that uh my friends and i had that shared sort of experience it's because like this our energy is contagious you know even if you're sad right it's 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 radiating outwards and we can pick up on it and so if you're in a high state of consciousness others can also pick up on it and if they're receptive and open they can begin to vibrate with you the nervous system can begin to uh, become co-regulated with you mm -hmm. and they can experience their own energetic shifts within their own nervous system within their own chakras and for some that can lead to a full-blown kundalini awakening for others it can be a temporary state of expanded consciousness that then re they return back to an ordinary state later on um it varies greatly across the board it all depends on uh what a person brings to the table in terms of you know the type of work that they've done in the past uh, their openness, their receptiveness, the themes that they're exploring in their life, um, what their uh, you know their mission is in life as well. Not everybody's meant to have a Kundalini awakening and become a Kundalini podcaster or something, right? <laughs> but some are meant to have an experience, connection between mind and heart, maybe like what you describe, or maybe they're meant to have an expanded state of consciousness in their mind and they kind of tap into incredible creativity, and that's how they bring forth their gifts. Everyone has sort of different things, um, but there are some events like that. I would also just say as a preface, uh, not a preface, a disclaimer, you know, some people offer these Shaktipat transmissions or they may are, they might advertise that they're going to awaken your Kundalini and uh, they may genuinely have some spiritual um, skills, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, in a weekend you're going to become enlightened. It doesn't mean that those people are also beyond taking advantage of you because some mm -hmm. people with great spiritual development um, still have unaddressed wounds and tendencies and it can lead to uh, uh, toxic dynamics. Um, you, know, you can quite literally call it, you know, it can lead to, to abusive cults, you could say. So it's important that everyone uses their discernment. Um, but that doesn't mean we avoid those places. You know, like I, like I said, I was enjoying the transmission from uh, guys like Ram Das, David Sparrow, Matt Kahn through YouTube, mm -hmm. through YouTube. So, uh, like I said, you know, the the energy is is contagious and it's not limited to the the material world. It can be transmitted through a text message, even. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a very fascinating thing to point out too. Is is uh, I mean, it's really kind of you know in in the uh, you know Eastern philosophy. There's we'll hear about um, saints where people will you know line up to meet these people. We have uh, Amma, the hugging saint. If you if you've heard of her, um, yeah. I've heard for, uh, experiences of people you know, like not really believing in that sort of thing, but then they go there and they're in her vicinity and they're just like, it's undeniable. Like there's just this thing where you just love this woman. Like you're just, you just feel intense love when you're around this. And uh, yeah, for anybody listening, you could pretty much, this is a saint. Uh, she's still alive today, actually. Um, uh, and she, she's called the hugging saint because she just lines up for countless, countless hours. I mean, I think it's, they have like, I feel like I've heard people mention that she does multiple days or like at least a day straight where she doesn't like sit, she doesn't get up and use the restroom or anything. She just yeah. one person after the next gets to hug her and they feel this intense bliss and it's, she's present with every single person and she will be, you know, like matching their energy. And, and um, yeah, so that, so it's, so it's interesting uh, that we have these beings um, and, and we're all these beings too is, is what's actually very interesting um, that, we almost have like um have an influence on other people's energy you know we have 
um, uh, th- there's like a permission to see some form of truth with some versions of the spiritual path. Um, and, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I guess when I brought up the um, Joe Dispenza thing, um, because yeah, whether they use the language or not, that kind of seems like what they're doing. Like I, again, before I really knew much about Kundalini or anything about Kundalini, I was doing some, uh, just like guided meditations from Joe Dispenza. Um, and you know, you're, you're kind of intentionally like squeezing these different areas of your body. Um, and you're kind of like imagining things going up through your head. So I think that, I don't think that he's trying to like cause massive kundalini awakenings but he certainly is you know it's it's yeah. the, through through the realm of healing you know but but i will say you know it's that's why i'm i'm so i'm grateful for your work i'm grateful for people like you who are um you know you're just you're peppering your youtube channel with just such perfect tools to use along the way you know so like maybe people who have listened to your channel um are coming to you from reading Joe Dispenza's work or not, um, you know, not even just him, just these various teachers who are, um, um, you know, expediting the spiritual process along the way. And you come out the other side and you're like, dude, what is happening? Because in in the Western world, we don't have a lot of this language, like we said in the beginning, is hidden behind um, religious and spiritual texts. And a lot of our modern ways of speaking about these things is very like, whoa, keep keep that woo woo stuff away from me or keep that religious stuff away from me. But there's, there's a lot of wonderful stuff in it, you know? And so, um, me as someone growing up, I think I would be, you know, like a self-diagnosed agnostic or or some sort of like atheist without really ever thinking deeply about it. I just like to call myself that, um, uh, you know, and I started going through all these experiences myself and, um, I think maybe, maybe I could have helped myself more along the way if I, um, if I had a, you know, childhood and upbringing and teenage years where, where I read these sorts of, of books that I find fascinating and wonderful now, um, there's just a lot of good, juicy, real human energetic slash being, uh, a grounded human being, uh, it, it meshes very well in, in, in that realm. Um, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Did, did you have any more thoughts on that, Brent? Did you have any more, um, yeah. Well, I, I wanted to just thank you for uh, for checking out my work in general. I, I appreciate the support. The reason that I do that work is for exactly that reason. Uh, the reason I talk about Kundalini openly um, is because when I understood that I was going through Kundalini Awakening, that was the greatest gift that could have gotten on this path hmm. um, in, in a sense. And so I just want to give that to other people because like you said, I, I'm, I'm, I just want to validate what you said. Many people are going through different meditations on YouTube or some sort of breath work or some sort of psychedelic experience, even facilitated by a so-called professional or a shaman or somebody that's you know offering these things as a service. And they're having genuine Kundalini risings and awakenings. And the facilitator or the teacher or the YouTube guide or the app has no resources for them. There's no support. Um they have to go out and figure it out on their own. Um, now, we could argue that, yeah, that's part of the journey. It's part of how the Tao wants to unfold. And I can make, you know, we can make a strong argument for that, for sure. But I think that we do still have the responsibility that if we are playing the role of some sort of energy healer, Reiki master, et cetera, et cetera, meditation teacher, yoga teacher, if we're, you know, facilitating breath work or psychedelic workshops, you need to understand that very significant, powerful, energetic unfoldings like Kundalini awakening can take place and they can turn a person's life upside down. And I feel that it's important that not everybody has to go through Kundalini awakening. You don't need to be a go through Kundalini awakening in order to teach meditation, but just become aware of these things, become aware of some resources, just so that if somebody approaches you and says, hey, in that meditation, I had a huge explosion of energy from my spine, in my head, in my heart. I can't stop vibrating after that meditation. What's going on? And somebody can say, like how my friend said to me, that sounds like Kundalini. Hmm. Just hearing the word, then they can go off and Google and they'll be okay. It's just, I just think that's so important because I've come across like many yoga teachers who 
who don't know what this stuff is. They don't know that yoga has a very strong energetic component to it. They just think it's about stretching and being, you know, finding a little bit of peace or something. That's a component to it. But the energetic potential of these practices is massive. And um, that's why I'm doing this work. And, and I encourage anybody out there just to, if you had an experience like yourself, um, I, you know, your podcast is incredible. You got so many different topics that you're talking about from so many different perspectives and people coming on from different uh, walks of life. But you still mentioned Kundalini here and there in your process and your awakening and how you're going through this. That alone, these little hints just to get the conversation going. It's out in the zeitgeist of our conversation collectively. It's a known thing now, right? So somebody listening to your podcast that's interested in maybe, the, you know, your experiences with uh, mental health. They may hear something that you're talking about awakening. They may say, whoa, 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 whoa. What's this guy talking about? This kind of happened to me. Finally, I have a word to describe what I've experienced. So the more we get it out there here and there, the more people have a little bit of breadcrumb to pick up. It's like, you know, if I can just like belabor this thing, it's like, you know, putting a little bit of like flags in a forest that mark the way out. If mm -hmm. somebody gets lost, they see a flag, they're like, okay, I can find my way now. It's like that. So that's my intention with this work because, you know, it's powerful, profound, transformative stuff. And we need to raise awareness. We need to raise awareness. I think that's where the collective is going because more people are, are going to be going through these ships. More mm -hmm. and more people. Um, I just wanted to just uh, comment briefly on uh, Ama. I think uh, she's incredible. I actually uh, attended uh, one of her meetings in Toronto. And oh, yeah, wow. huge crowd. Um, now, did you experience... lineup. Did, did you yeah. did you hug her or did you experience like the energy like I was mentioning? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, even just being within the vicinity of that place, there is a palpable uh, field, energetic field that she has, you know, radiating. Um, I think it goes in conjunction with the people that are attracted to her as well. We're all collectively radiating a very uh, high vibratory energetic field, you could say. And uh, yeah, so I went uh, up for a hug. Uh, I had gone with my with my current girl, my current girlfriend, um, a few years ago, and she'll hug individuals, and she also will hug couples together. Mm -hmm. And so I went up with my girlfriend, and the host, um, you know, one of her her helpers there, uh, ushered me to get a hug. And so I hugged Amma by myself, and you know, you, 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 it's very palpable. You can feel like this great peace. It's like you're really being held by by like the divine mother or something to that to that nature at least that's what i felt i feel like everyone might have their own experience and then the uh helper recognized that oh this woman is his partner all right send her up give them both a hug together so i got a two hugs out of it so i got to hug uh <laughs> hug her with my with my girlfriend as well <laughs> so uh, it was a special experience for sure it was uh it was exciting and 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 she you know gives a a talk um uh, so sort of a satsang to the, the big group. Um, and she just on the topic of integration and embodiment and being human being, you know, she's the hugging saint, incredible. You know, she could quite literally sit and just hug people all day or even just not say anything and just be in silence. But she's a, a humanitarian. Um, you know, she's helped a lot of poor people. I think she's done a lot. I mean, the, 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 the philanthropy that she, that has come out through her organization is it's unprecedented, and so it's just another example of of what it means to be human. And yeah, she may be enlightened or self realized or whatever you want to call it, but she's still you know got her feet on the ground, helping people to to you know have a bit of a better life. And I think that's really important as well. It's an important message for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's it's a it's just a great example of where uh, service seems to reign supreme. You know, the, you hear that in all these sort of just all all the religious and spiritual teachings. They they'll have some sort of like serve people, and you'll see. You know, and it is that I think finding your own version of service. There is some uh, like freedom, and it's um. You know, Terence McKenna says, uh, uh, um, what is it like? You you jump off the cliff 
into the abyss and realize it's a feathery bed or something like that. You know, yeah. and it's the, as you walk upon the path, the path will appear, you know, it's those sorts of things. And I think service is, uh, you know, we all have our own version of service and it just feels right to us. Like not trying to mimic the way that somebody else does it, but just being, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm an artist. And so I, I, it's a constant, um, you know, my work is to figure out what's, what's me, like, what's my art, what, what, what it, what it, what am I expressing, you know, and, oh, am I trying to mimic somebody? Am I taking them as inspiration or am I, you know, really, really giving what I only I can give? And, um, that's kind of the role of the artist, but I think it's also the role of a, a spiritual teacher in a sense too. You know, I think, I, I feel like I see spiritual teachers as artists themselves, you know, uh, you know, l- learning about their own paintbrush and learning, um, you know, w- ways in which they can, uh, paint reality for, for, for other people, um, to make us all feel more, more grounded while also feeling connected to, to the divine, you know, um, I, I would like to, to round about, so I have this, uh, that one of the books that I bought was, I don't know if you can see it. Nice. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. backwards. Yeah. I don't know if you've read that one. Um, but, uh, it's Kundalini Vidya, the science of spiritual transformation. Uh, it's from Joanne, Sh- uh, Shiva Par- Parita Harrigan. I don't know why I just butchered that so bad. Um, but so, so I read about that. Um, I got that book and I feel like it helped me in, in, in some senses. Um, I will also recommend for anybody else going through Kundalini, um, there, there's a, a podcast called Buddha at the gas pump. I mentioned that to the, to you the other day. Um, you said you've checked it out. There is actually a whole category on the back gap Buddha at the gas pump website of kundalini and it's a just this wonderful man rick archer uh who talks with uh spiritually awakening beings and uh there's just like a lot of good resources in there and again you're hearing people talk about their kundalini journey so it's there's really something very grounding about feeling heard and seen and like oh wow i'm going through these same things and like it's okay for me to allow them because other people have gone through them and they've and they're you know right. reassuring me that that that's going well um i will also mention aaron apke has some good stuff on youtube about kundalini awakenings uh, i just wonder brent if you had um of course your channel like your channel is so great for anybody going through spiritual awakening i feel like your thumbnails are great for it your titles are great uh really you draw people right in where they're going to need to go so like, man, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so oh, much for your you. work. But um, do, you. do you have anybody else that you might kind of throw in, throw into the pile for anybody who maybe they've listened up to this point and they're like, wow, I think I have gone through this or I am going through this or I know a friend who's going through this. Uh, w- what else might you throw their way? What other you know books or resources? Um, I, I recently read a book by an incredible woman named Dr. Yvonne Kason. It's called Touched by the Light. I found that to be uh, really clear, documenting some of the after effects, the physical after effects, the energetic after effects, psychic after effects of the awakening process. Um, she's incredible. She's been through her own uh, really significant shifts. Um, there's a book called The Spiritual Awakening Guide by Mary Mueller Shutan, mm-hmm. which I really enjoy as well. Uh, especially after the major shifts uh, on the mind level, like how I described earlier on in my journey, that massive awakening into my mind, seeing, you know, non-duality or the shift out of ego and no self. I found the work by Adya Shanti to be very, very uh, useful for me. So he has a book called The End of Your World, Uncensored Straight Talk on the Nature of Enlightenment. And so he speaks about uh, integration and embodiment uh, in, in that book in in uh, really clear ways. He is another teacher that doesn't openly talk about Kundalini, but for, from what I understand, he, he's been through Kundalini Awakening. It's not uh, within uh, the, the wording that he uses often, um, but it's there. And, you know, there, there's many teachers that have gone through it that don't, don't talk about it openly. Um, because of course it's, it's polarizing, uh, and scary for some, it can turn some people off. Um, let me see here. Um, I love, um, of course, uh, the power of now, uh, the work by Matt Kahn has been very incredible for me to, uh, to lay the foundation for what it means to unconditionally love. I found Matt Kahn's work, uh, to really be incredible. And, uh, for a bit of, a. uh, I guess I could say light, enjoyable read. Uh, Ram Das is be here now. Oh yeah, uh, A plus. Yeah, incredible, incredible. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, I, I love how you mentioned, um, you know, not a lot of these people really, they don't use the same terminologies. They're not always talking about Kundalini Awakening, but I think once you kind of have a grasp of what it is, um, you, you can hear a lot of these spiritual, uh, you know, conversations are kind of talking about Kundalini Awakening. I've heard, um, I don't think it was you, I've heard somebody talking about how, uh, you know, a very, like if you imagine in your mind, a very... Um, Christian, uh, like older lady, uh, who, you know, maybe her, her hobby is knitting, uh, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm pulling this from a Ram Dass talk actually, but, uh, like she, she has, she may have gone through a very profound Kundalini awakening, but she would never use those terminologies. She would use, um, you know, Christ-like consciousness or, or, she, you know, probably wouldn't even say that, but, um, she, she would, th- th- there's many different ways of describing this experience, you know, and I think Kundalini in a lot of ways is just another way. It's another way that we can gain information and um, so, some grounding. And, you know, I think if you're listening and, and this sounds like, you know, enticing to you, maybe that's your your path of learning what's going on in, in your experiences. Um, may, maybe you pursue a little bit farther down Kundalini Awakening, um, whether you typically use those terminologies or not. Um, just to say that many different people are going through what we would probably consider kundalini awakening if it's something that we all had a um you know the the, a similar language for so yeah um well said yeah uh so man i i think we're getting up here in time i would love to wrap it up um i would love uh uh, of course, please mention where to find you. I, I will link things um, in, in the description, of course, but I would, would love one more thing, just whatever pops into your mind. Um, for anybody listening who is going through a Kundalini awakening or has going through a Kundalini awakening or they're just on the spiritual path, uh, do you have a message for them? Do, do you have anything that comes to mind? Like, what, what um, Speak to these people who are on the awakening path. Anything pop into your mind, Brett? Yeah, I feel like saying, you know, one step at a time when things are difficult just be with that one step that one difficult step when things are going great you can also recognize that you are you're walking you're moving even the great things may change as you continue forward so you enjoy those things but be mindful as well that uh nothing lasts good or bad one step at a time be fully present with whatever's whatever's there the difficult things the uh, exciting things, the mystical things. Um, I like to think of it as uh, as a journey. Um, Part of my aim is to really squash the idea that there's ever a finish line, no finish line, not in my view. We keep going and and, uh, exploring new things and and revisiting things in new ways. And, And no matter what you're going through, it's all welcome unconditionally, unconditionally. The real deal spiritual path with an open heart does not push anything away. Nothing at all. It's all welcome here. Yeah. So beautifully said. So beautifully said. Yeah. uh, uh, Yeah. Allow it. Allow it. Mm. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, All right, man. Uh, Real quick, drop where where to find you at. You're under Brent Spirit on on Instagram and, and YouTube and everything. Yeah. Yeah, Brent Spirit. Yeah. And uh, you can also find me on my website, brentspirit.com. Uh, I've got my podcast on uh, Spotify and Apple. It's called The Spiritual Awakening Show. Excellent. Cool. Definitely check that out. Um, Brent, thank you so much for your time. Again, I will link all of those sorts of things. And um, man, certainly stay in touch. I, I really love talking to you, man. And I really love uh, just consuming your work. And um, I, I love, you know, as, as I'm scrolling through on on Instagram and stuff, just seeing, seeing your clips. So please keep doing what you're doing. And, and thank you so much for doing it. Oh, thank you. You're so, so welcome. And right back at you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. I've been uh, listening to some of your music, your spoken word. Cool stuff, man. I really had a great time today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. Excellent, man. We'll be in touch. I'll let you know. Um, I'll tag you in clips and whatnot as, as I make them. And then once I drop the episode, I'll shoot you a message. Okay. Sweet. All right. Take care now. Cool. Love yourself, everybody. Peace out. Much love. Peace. Hello and welcome to the Junkyard Love Podcast.
Knowledge is power.